Chapter 2, Environment, the trainee in Anapanasati must have a clear idea of the practice as a whole, deriving what help he can from metaphors. The teachers of old were very fond of metaphors, for instance, in his introductory verse the writer of the Path of Purification, the Satimaga, describes the practice as follows, the wise man, standing firm on the ground, takes up the edged weapon in his hands, sharpens it on the stone, and working diligently, succeeds in clearing away the thick jungle. The wise man is anyone with inborn insight, sahajatapanna, or what is nowadays called intelligence. This is an immature form of insight, which has to be developed into true and genuine insight, vipassanapanna. The person who is to take up the mental training has to be sufficiently sharp to develop further intuitive insight. A dull person cannot take up the practice in the way dealt with here. As a rule, he is first to follow the way based on faith or resort to the various kinds of rites and rituals. Although possessed of intelligence, the meditator must stand firm on the ground, the ground of moral discipline, sila. He must be well established in moral discipline so as to be free from the coarser type of defects and free from suffering caused by. The things about him moral discipline is compared to ground that is firm and solid enough to stand on securely, as opposed to muddy ground or treacherous, marshy ground. Anyone who earnestly wishes to undertake mental training, irrespective of whether he is a bhikkhu or a layman, must make the ground of morality clean enough to stand on. The edged weapon is worldly wisdom, the various kinds of understanding that come from study, especially those relating to mental development. By a process of sharpening, this mundane wisdom is transformed into supermundane wisdom, which is penetrating enough to put an end to the fetters, samyajana, and the inherent tendencies, anusya. The hands are Pariharika Panna, operative insight, the type of insight that shows a person wandering on in Sasra just what he has to do. It means natural insight so developed that one realizes exactly what has to be done and how to do it. The stone is concentration, concentration must be practiced before insight, it is the basis for wisdom and insight, vipassana. Concentration, whether natural or consciously developed, is the stone on which the weapon is sharpened. Diligence implies the four bases of power, adhipada, which are, willingness and earnestness in what one does. Determination, that is, taking the practice seriously, keen interest in the practice, that is, Devotion to the practice from beginning to end without any deviation, spirit of inquiry accompanied by clear comprehension. To solve intelligently and in time any problem that may arise in the course of the practice. These four bases of power, aspiration, energy, concentration, and investigation, chanda, bariya, siddha, vimas, are essential for success. The thick jungle is the tangle of mental defilements, these defilements pierce and prick just as does the thorny undergrowth in a thick jungle. To succeed in clearing away the thick jungle is to clear away the cluttering undergrowth of defilements as one would clumps of thorny bamboo. Thick and inextricably interwoven, these metaphors outline the way of practice and also clarify the interrelationships between the various wholesome qualities, morality and so on. They serve to clear up misunderstanding and also to give encouragement to practice. The wise man, standing firm on the ground, takes up the edged weapon in his hands, sharpens it on the stone, and working diligently, succeeds in clearing away the thick jungle. This formula must always be clear to the inner eye of anyone who practices. A person who has made up his mind to take up mental training has first to get rid of the impediments. The impediments, palaboda, are physical things big and small that may tie the meditator down in various ways. The following are the 10 well-known examples of impediments. 1. Dwelling, Avesa Palaboda. Here the meditator is concerned about his dwelling, worried about where he is to live, and also about the comfortable monastery, and quarters that he has to abandon in order to train in the forest or elsewhere. The impediment of dwelling even includes concern with responsibilities to the small hut in which one is to practice, such as getting rid of termites, mending a leaking roof, or anything else that may need taking care of all these are impediments, obstacles in the way of the practice. The meditator must solve all of these problems completely right at the outset so that once he has started to practice there is nothing for him to be concerned about whatsoever, clearly, then, 
it is better for a beginner to go and practice in a completely new environment where nothing belongs to him. Better still is to practice under a tree rather than in a hut, though the tree chosen must be in a secluded place where the meditator will not be disturbed by curious onlookers, he cannot find such a tree, he must just remain indifferent, taking no notice of anyone who may come to stare. Living under a tree gets completely rid of the impediment of dwelling. 2. Family. Kula Palabodha This impediment consists in concern on the part of the meditator regarding his supporters the people who maintain and help him in any way, worry about their perhaps being ill, missing them if unable to meet them every day, and so on. Affection and attachment to supporters is bound to be a cause of worry. The meditator must change his mental attitude in such a way that for him his supporters are, for the time being, as if no longer alive. 3. Worldly Gain Lava Palabodha here the meditator is afraid of losing advantages he had before taking up the practice. Included under this impediment is the feeling of expectation of still more gain, name, fame, and so on after completing the practice. Taken together, these all amount to fear of loss. The meditator must clearly see gain, name, and fame as repulsive because detrimental to the practice for the attainment of nirvana on any level. While in training the meditator must give up all possessions, past, present, and even future, and accept a life of poverty. If needs arise during the practice, he should not talk or think about them then and there, but should leave them to be dealt with later. 4. Social Commitments Ganapalabodha This impediment consists in concern about the people under one's authority, care, or responsibility. Such social commitments must be completely given up. The meditator must be firmly determined to live really alone. Although he is to go back to live in society at the end of the training, he must, until then, be free from all concern about such matters. 5. Work Kamapalabodha Any kind of work left unfinished, for which the meditator is responsible, or of which he is extremely fond, or to which he is habituated, these are to be counted impediments. The meditator must reflect wisely and see clearly that no work is of importance other than the present practice of mental development. No work of trifling value must be given precedence over this, the most valuable and important work of all. Or if it is possible to solve in some way the problem of a trivial job, for instance by assigning it to some suitable person, then that should be done before beginning the practice. 6. Travel at Hana Palabodo worry resulting from making journeys constitutes an impediment for two kinds of person. It is an impediment first of all, for anyone who practices while traveling. In this case, the meditator must not allow himself to be worried about anything related to his journey, such as where he is going to stay the following day, and the like. The technique for eliminating this impediment is to feel as if one is traveling only a short distance. Secondly, it is an impediment for a person who trains while staying in one place, but who enjoys traveling to distant parts. Such a person must overcome his feeling of attachment to traveling. He should, for instance, be unconcerned about the season and about the weather and should give no thought to this or that place as worth seeing, worth living at, and the like. Furthermore, he should not think about past trips which he enjoyed so much. And during the rains retreat, he should not make plans about where to go after the period of retreat is over. 7. Relatives, Nadi Palabodha, concern about kith and kin, right from father and mother down to distant relatives, can be an impediment. The meditator must not allow concern about the happiness or unhappiness of relatives, far or near, to be a stumbling block in the way of his practice. If he earnestly intends to practice, he must not let himself be influenced in any way by such things. If a monk, he should recall that to be a monk is to renounce the world, being a monk he is understood to have completely renounced his relatives. He should further reflect that, especially during the training period, one must develop a sense of complete renunciation of everybody and everything. If a householder, the meditator should reflect that he is going in search of the very best thing for both himself and his relatives. Further, both monk and householder may reflect that no relative can help one to attain freedom from the vicious circle of samsara. In this even the nearest relatives, parents, sons, daughters, cannot be of any help at all.
Everyone has to help himself and so should be given every chance to do so. Only a person who has freed himself from the round of samsara is in a position to help relatives still wandering on and on in samsara. No one can help others to become free if he is not to some extent free himself.